Thanks for watching. Let's talk about the Razapam or Ativan. This belongs to the benzodiazepine family of anti-anxiety medicines. It has tranquilizing effects on the central nervous system. Approved by the Food and Drug Administration in 1977. It remains among the top 75 prescription medicines here in the United States with more than 14 million prescriptions written every year, even though it's more than 40 years old. The drug is on the World Health Organization list of essential medicines. The activities of Lorazepam or Ativan, well, it treats anxiety, it's a sedative, a hypnotic, it's anticonvulsant, a muscle relaxant, and it also tends to cause amnesia. It's used for those people over age 18 who have some anxiety disorder as the primary condition or anxiety as a secondary condition to some other psychiatric abnormality or some other kind of a problem, used for people who have insomnia related to anxiety, and can be used before surgery as pre-medication. It's not supposed to be used for everyday anxiety, even though a lot of people take it for that, and it's not used for depression or for psychoses. According to the American Psychiatric Association, more than 10% of us are going to suffer from anxiety in the course of any given year, and to make the medical definition of anxiety, you have to have at least three of six symptoms. The symptoms include feeling either restless or keyed up or on edge, being easily fatigued, having difficult time concentrating and the mind going blank, being irritable, having muscle tension, or having sleep disturbance. Sleep disturbance means difficulty getting to sleep or staying asleep or having a refreshing night of sleep. It's not used for people who have secondary anxiety to substance abuse, not used for people who have medical disorders that are causing anxiety. So for instance, hyperthyroidism, treat the hyperthyroidism instead, of course. To make the diagnosis of anxiety, the medical diagnosis, you have to have the symptoms for at least six months and they have to occur most of the days a week and they have to interfere with multiple different kinds of activities at work, at home, at school, with your finances. Medicine also can be used for people who require mechanical ventilation and then need to be sedated or people who have acute coronary syndrome from cocaine abuse or for people who have long epileptic seizures. So the typical epileptic seizure resolves relatively quickly, but sometimes a person develops what's known as status epilepticus. And that's a condition where the epileptic seizure goes on and on, obviously a serious significant problem, and can be treated with intravenous, not oral, but intravenous Ativan, intravenous lorazepam. There also is good evidence that it seems to work on sleep, especially if it's taken about 30, 60 minutes before you go to bed seems to decrease the sleep latency, increase the phase one and phase two sleep, but unfortunately rapidly develop tolerance to the medicine. And when it's used to treat anxiety, we know that anxiety oftentimes comes along with other kind of problems. So for instance, a lot of people with anxiety suffer from queasy stomach or diarrhea, or they urinate quite frequently, or they can have palpitations or feel their heart is racing seems that Ativan, Razapam, does not treat any of those other conditions that go along with the anxiety. Well, it's rapidly becoming a drug that's used off-label for an enormous number of indications, including the most frequently, is I just feel anxious or nervous, so people pop pills. That's probably not such a great idea. But it's also used for people who have withdrawal from alcohol and suffer from delirium, people who have panic attacks, people who are receiving chemotherapy for cancer and have anticipatory nausea or vomiting, people who have a condition known as the cannabis hyperemesis syndrome where people vomit, the chronic users of marijuana, people who have REM sleep behavior disorder. During REM sleep, typically, the muscles are immobilized but in the REM sleep behavior disorder, they are not. And while you're having these vivid dreams, you're flailing about. That's good reason to take the Ativan. Sometimes in people who have Alzheimer's disease and have anxiety reactions, well, it seems that the neurodegeneration of Alzheimer's disease does not tend to involve the GABA pathways, the gamma aminobenzoic acid pathways. And those are the pathways that the benzodiazepines work on. So it may well be that for those people with Alzheimer's disease with anxiety, there might be some role for a drug like Ativan. 
Additionally, we know that Ativan is in the family of the benzodiazepines, which include its relatives of Valium and Clonopin and Xanax and Cerax and Librium and Restoril and Halcyon. It's available here in the United States in half milligram, one and two milligram tablets. It's available intravenously or intramuscularly, and in some places in the world, it's available as a skin patch or an oral solution or as a sublingual tablet. And fortunately, the Razepam or Ativan is not metabolized by the drug metabolizing enzymes in the liver, typical the 3A4 enzyme, cytochrome CYP3 A4. Well, that's good news because that means it doesn't interfere with the metabolism of a variety of other medicines, and those other medicines don't interfere with the metabolism of the lorazepam. So we win two ways with regard to that. Supposedly, you shouldn't take the drug for more than about four weeks. If you need to take the drug chronically, then you should stop every once in a while and assess the need for the treatment. It really hasn't been studied in people who are taking it for periods longer than about four months, but we know that a significant number of people take the drug just on a routine basis, and that probably isn't the greatest idea. What's the standard dose? Well, the standard dose for anxiety would be about two to six milligrams a day in divided doses. So you would take the largest dose at bedtime. For most people who are starting the drug, if they have anxiety, take one milligram, say two or three times a day. If you have insomnia, take anywhere between half a milligram and up to two milligrams shortly before bedtime is a single dose. Although if you happen to be over age 65 or if you're elderly or debilitated, then obviously if the medicine is appropriate, then it should be taken at a reduced dose. And it's much safer for those individuals than, say, Valium or Dalmain, which are medicines that last a lot longer inside the body. Now, preoperatively, it could be taken at a dose the night before surgery, two to four milligrams to help you sleep and help you get through the night without worrying too much. And then maybe you could take another dose an hour, two hours before the surgery, or sometimes people are given the dose just an hour, two hours before the surgery for status epilepticus, it's given intravenously, maximum two milligrams over a period of about a minute, and then can be repeated after about another five to ten minutes, if appropriate. You shouldn't take, should not take the benzodiazepines if you're sensitive to the family, then you don't take the lorazepam to Ativan. Or if you have obstructive sleep apnea, or if you have chronic obstructive lung disease with incipient respiratory failure, or if you have severe respiratory insufficiency, or you have severe asthma attack, or if you have acute narrow angle glaucoma since it tends to dilate the pupil, shouldn't take it if you have depression, or if you have myasthenia gravis. And if you're going to take it preoperatively and you're going to have day surgery, then make sure somebody's around to drive you home. There is evidence that you can become tolerant to the effect both as a sedative and as a hypnotic, a sleeping pill. The ratio of some of the other benzodiazepines, so one milligram of Xanax would be equivalent of about two milligrams of lorazepam, and 10 milligrams of Valium would be equivalent to about one and a quarter milligram of the lorazepam. The side effect profile of lorazepam is relatively clean. It can cause respiratory depression and it can cause central nervous system depressant effects on a dose dependent amount. So it can cause sedation, can cause dizziness and weakness and unsteadiness. And certainly the more susceptible a person is, the older a person is, the more frail a person is, the greater the likelihood of side effects can affect your memory and cause some memory impairment, confusion, cloudiness of consciousness, can cause some disorientation and difficulty walking, and can cause an unmasking of depression, can cause sexual dysfunction, and ultimately might cause convulsions or seizures in individuals. And paradoxically, especially in children or the elderly, can cause some um, anxiety or restlessness that it was supposed to treat, where it can cause agitation or irritation or excitability, can cause aggression and rage, can cause insomnia instead of treat it, can cause hallucinations and sexual arousal. More ordinarily, it just causes some nausea, maybe some constipation that can change your appetite, maybe cause some difficulty with sight or difficulty speaking, or sometimes can cause incontinence. If you have a liver disorder, 
that prevents the liver from metabolizing normally, probably a good idea to stay away from the drug. And in people who have esophageal problems, there's an issue where in animal studies, it seems that the lorazepam dilates the esophagus. If you stop the medicine, if the medicine stopped in the animals, after one to two months, then the esophagus gets back to normal caliber. But not if the medicine is continued on a prolonged basis. We don't know how that affects humans, unfortunately. And if you're taking an anticholinergic medicine and you happen to have some other kind of problems, like you have a prostate problem if you're an older man or if you have some difficulty with constipation, well, it's going to be made worse if you take an antihistamine or an antidepressant or atropine kind of drug. And if you're on the medicine and you stop the medicine, if you stop the lorazepam, if you were using it for seizure control, you could have seizures. And interestingly, even if you didn't have seizures, if you've been taking it for a long time and stop it too abruptly, then you could have a seizure. It can cause anterograde amnesia, so cause forgetfulness in the future, cause you not to be able to make memories, cause memory impairment, cause you to act inappropriately. And if you happen to have a history of low blood pressure, you have to be very cautious taking the medicine because it can further reduce your blood pressure, especially if you're elderly, especially if you're taking an antihypertensive medication. And if you combine the drug with an opioid, then it can cause profound sedation and respiratory distress and coma and even death. Now, by itself, the lorazepam or the Ativan, if that's the only drug you're taking, chances are you can overdose and you're not going to die from taking just that drug. On the other hand, you start popping it in the presence of opioids or alcohol or other kind of drugs, and unfortunately, significant problems may occur. Now, we also know that if you've been taking the drug for a while, and a while could be a short time period as just a week, and you stop the medicine, you could have some withdrawal reactions. And that occurs with the benzodiazepines that have a short half-life, and that would be the Ativan, Lorazepam, or the Xanax, or the Halcyon, or the Serax. And the withdrawal reaction could be simple. It could be some nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, headache, or abdominal cramps, or anxiety, or tension. But it could cause you to start to perspire heavily and become irritated and agitated, have palpitations and panic attacks, and have vertigo, be confused. And sometimes, unfortunately, when you withdraw the medicine, you can have a rebound of the underlying condition for which you were taking the medicine, and you can have a rebound in the insomnia, and if you happen to have depression, then you could commit suicide. So that's a problem. So as a result, in people who've been taking the medicines for any period of time, then it's a slow taper, a taper that can be as short as four weeks to as long as four months. And unfortunately, sometimes, if you've been taking it long enough, you can have memory impairment that can last for as long as six months. Well, if you overdose on the medicine, it can cause lethargy and confusion, obviously sedates the central nervous system, and then can cause coma and death, especially if you happen to be taking it in combination with other medicines or with alcohol. If you overdose, then supportive therapy is usually what's done. Sometimes you receive some activated charcoal so that you don't absorb any of the Xanax that happens, I'm sorry, any of the Ativan that happens to be sitting in the intestinal system. Just like with the opioids, we have naloxone. Well, with the benzodiazepines, we have flumazenil. But the flumazenil doesn't help the respiratory depression and it increases the likelihood that you'll have seizures. So basically, it's supportive care. Now, Unfortunately, in the last portions of pregnancy, in the first couple years of life, if children receive the medicine, then it causes widespread neural degeneration and cell loss. And in the developing brain, obviously, that's going to lead to some cognitive and behavioral changes. So as a result, this is an absolute don't take if you happen to be pregnant, especially in the third trimester, anywhere up to three years of life, the first three years of life. And newborns conjugate the medicine relatively slowly, so even with a little bit of the medicine, it's not going to be excreted quickly. It's going to last for about seven days in the system. And it interferes with the conjugation of bilirubin, and that can lead to yellowing of the skin and deterioration of the brain. So obviously we have a problem with this drug in children. Well, additionally, 
we have the medicine working on the GABA receptors, the GABA benzodiazepine receptors. They're widespread in the brain. And what happens is it sits on those receptors and then you get more GABA in the system so that it can work. And as a result, we have it working on the chloride ion conductance into the cell and the sodium conductance into the cell. And as a result, it inhibits the amygdala and that reduces anxiety, it inhibits the cerebral cortex, and that decreases the likelihood of seizures. Well, unfortunately, the drug's also used recreationally, and sometimes it's used to facilitate criminal activities because of the amnesia, the anterograde amnesia, amnesia for things after you take the drug, the sedative hypnotic effects. So it can be used as a date rape drug like ruitinol. It can be used for robberies. A lot of people who are taking the drug for non-medical purposes, taking it recreationally, end up in the emergency room, especially if they happen to be combining the drug with uh, opioids. Well, the whole family, the benzodiazepines, were discovered back in 1954. And it was a chemist working at Roche Laboratory, Dr. Leo Sternbeck, who back in 1959 synthesized the first Librium, then Valium, and a couple years later, a researcher at Wyeth Laboratories, Dr. Richards, he discovered the lorazepam. And then over the course of the 1990s, there were more than a hundred different benzodiazepines on the market that were discovered. There, if we talk about the lorazepam, the Ativan, it's rapidly absorbed, 90% is bioavailable, peaks in the bloodstream within about two hours, 85% of it is bound to the proteins. Half-life is about 12 hours, ranges between 10 to 20 hours. The major metabolite, lorazepam glucuronide, its half-life is about the same, it's about 18 hours, doesn't have any central nervous system effect, it's metabolized and goes out three quarters of it in the urine, there's no accumulation in the body. If you have impairment of your kidney or your liver, you've got to be a little bit careful of taking the drug. And we know that if you're pregnant and you take the drug in the first trimester, it can cause later decreased intelligence, it can cause some neurodevelopmental problems, it can cause physical malformations in the heart and in the facial structures. And because half of pregnancies are unplanned. It's a good idea if you're a woman of childbearing potential and you're considering taking the medicine, well, you should get a pregnancy test first. And while you're taking the medicine, you should be on a very effective method of contraception. If a woman took the drug in the latter portions of pregnancy, well, then the fetus, the newborn infant, might demonstrate signs of hypoactivity, less active than normal, hypotonia, floppy, low temperature, respiratory distress, difficulty breathing, difficulty feeding, problem with the temperature, where the temperature, the body temperature goes down. Have to be cautious if you're taking the medicine, you have pre-existing depression, you have to be careful taking it with other central nervous system depressants, including alcohol. You have to be careful driving a car if you take the medicine. You have to be careful of the physical and the psychological dependence that might occur, especially at increased dose, increased duration of the medicine, or if you have a history of alcohol or drug use or abuse, or if you have personality disorder. Should not take the medicine if you're taking clozapine. That's an atypical antipsychotic. If you happen to be taking Depakote or valproic acid, if you happen to be taking probenicid, you have to be very careful if you're taking phenobarbital or dilantin or the opioids or the antipsychotics or alcohol. Very careful because of the reaction, the intermittent reaction or the, the reaction of the drugs one with another. Well, there's a condition known as catatonia. And it was originally thought that it was part of the family of schizophrenia, but we know that it can be part of the manic depressive disorder, part of a variety of medical illnesses, even part of just simple depression. Well, this is a condition where people express mutism or negativism or peculiar posturing or grimacing or staring or peculiar mannerisms or rigid, unmoving muscle masses, 
mask-like face, eyes focused at a distance. If you move the joint in one manner, it just seems to stay there. Well, lorazepam is a good treatment for that condition, a condition that we find is relatively common. And so too with the cannabis hyperemesis syndrome. It's a variant of the cyclical vomiting syndrome, first described in 2004. People who are recurrent users, chronic users of cannabis, have these episodes of nausea and vomiting that we can't explain. And they have intervals where they're seemingly symptom-free, and then they start again with this periodic vomiting. Well, that can lead to acute renal failure, can lead to electrolyte derangements, can cause a variety of other problems. And one of the nifty treatments is simply lorazepam. Now, 61 milligram lorazepam, number 60, so the 60 pills of the one milligram lorazepam, you could get with coupon the generic drug for anywhere between eight and twenty dollars. Now in 1987 the cost, the average wholesale cost for a month of the drug was somewhere between five and ten dollars. That's a brand name drug. The brand name drug now if you want a month of the drug costs nineteen hundred fifty dollars for the brand name. Doesn't make any sense. And now we have a situation where the government has decided that People take too many benzodiazepines, and benzodiazepines on a chronic basis aren't good for us. They have a variety of problems, so they want people to transition to other medicines, but unfortunately the other medicines seem to be far worse. So they want people transitioned for anxiety disorders to the SSRIs that were principally used for depression, drugs like Prozac and Celexa and Paxil, and sometimes drugs like Welbutrin and Effexor, but those drugs aren't so great either, and they have a significant number of side effects and problems with withdrawal from those drugs. So an increasing number of doctors are starting with the gabapentin and the trazodone and a variety of other similar drugs, and now they're even using the atypical antipsychotics, drugs like Abilify and Respiradol and Zyprexa, and they're even worse. So my advice is, if you need any of these drugs, and you need them on a protracted basis, be very careful which drug you happen to start because ultimately you're going to find that the drugs have more toxicity than you originally thought and you're going to have trouble getting off of the drugs and getting off of the drugs is going to lead to another whole set of symptoms. So do be careful. Anyway, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed the show. If you did, please tell a friend. Consider subscribing. We always appreciate your interest. I'm Dr. Ken Landau.